Lava Salon. This is our monthly Sunday salon. We have some really great speakers. Joan, you are going to talk about. <laughs> your AP is already set up. You're going to talk about Aggie. Where's Paul? And there's Paul. Paul, you're going to talk about the jeweled skeletons. And I'm leaving it that way. I'm going to talk really it's just, just to give you people an indicator. Uh, people are trickling in great. We're going to have a break in between Joan's talk and Paul's talk. So if you just got here, oh, I didn't get that cappuccino, there'll be an opportunity for Paul's talk. So don't worry. And they do bring food up. So if, if you, during the break, you want to order a sandwich, just order it and they'll bring it up. So what do I want to say, Kim, before we get started? I have a walking tour after this. It's a free walking tour. It's number three. Hashtag. Hashtag Broadway on my mind. If they come on the tour, we'll talk about that. Okay. okay. If you come, come on the stay, come on the tour. It's interesting. It's in the booklet. Um, we've got a sold out crime lab in in October 10th. I'm so I won't so talk nice. too much about that, but we do occasionally do uh, events at the uh, at the <coughs> Hersberg Davis Forensic Science Center. This is at Cal State Los Angeles. This is a joint crime lab run by the Sheriff's Department, the Los Angeles Police Department and the State Department of Justice, and a small part of that structure houses the Criminalistics Department for the for Cal State Los Angeles. So it's actually a part of its teaching, and that's where you do workshops. They're a lot of fun. I'm glad you're here. Richard, what is LAVA? LAVA is the Los Angeles Visionaries Association, Kim. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Joan, let's... Yeah. Um, no, no, I mean, there may be people who haven't been here before. Oh, sure. Here. Yeah. Uh, love is great. Uh, so basically, I put the artwork into a nonprofit, and like a month later, the board kicked me off, kicked my off. And so I said, well, there's so much fun stuff we're doing for the artwork, which we've been doing for years, which is why they asked me to run it. And then I said, well, we should just keep doing it. Let's just form this thing called Lava. So that's it. And mostly because we did really great walking tours for the art walk out of Clifton's. Yes. And we would yes. do like 600, like, no, 400 people yeah. a night. We yeah. counted. Yes. We moved 400 <laughs> people a night on a walk. I didn't give all of them. We had, we had four, five yeah. tours. We had but good, yeah. Which is all this great stuff. And we just decided, you know what? Nuts to them. Don't want to belong somewhere you, they don't want to. So we just started Lava. So that's what we did. So is that enough backstory, Kim? Perfect. Great. Okay, Joan, take it away. Okay. Well, hi, I'm Joan Renner. Thank you. And I'm really happy to be here. Before I get started, I just want to take an opportunity, because I don't tell them often enough how much I really appreciate Kim and Richard and Chinta for all they do. This free salon, free, yeah, F-R-E-E, -E, is amazing. It's a monthly event, and it's done as a labor of love. And I really, really appreciate that. It's a great place to come. And see, you know, and see and hear things that you wouldn't normally get anyplace else. So thanks, you guys. We love you. I love you too, Richard. Okay, uh, today it's my pleasure to introduce you to one of my favorite LA personalities, Aggie. It's Agnes Aggie Underwood. There she is, hoisting a brew. Um, I can relate to that. For those of you who have never heard of her, Aggie was a um, a journalist who became a crime reporter, that's what she became best known for. She reported for the Daily Record first in the, in the late 20s, and then she moved to the Herald Express. Now, and there she is interviewing someone at Amy Semple McPherson's funeral. And Aggie's 1949 autobiography, Newspaper Woman, uh, it was an inspiration for other women working in journalism around the country. And in fact, Cal State Northridge still gives an award in Aggie's name, the Agnes Underwood Award for reporting. Now, Aggie has inspired me as well. I wrote the Wikipedia entry for Aggie, and my blog, Deranged LA Crimes, is uh, just a tribute to Aggie's work. It's been about 30 years since Aggie passed away, and I regret never having met her. I I think we had a lot, we would have had a lot in common. I found out from one of her grandsons that she was an avid reader of mystery novels, which I am. <laughs> no. And uh, she also, and this was just completely a shock, she also collected perfume, which I had no idea. I collect vintage cosmetics ephemera. This is, these are some items from my collection. So um, I think 
aside from our mutual love of uh, oh, mystery novels and girly treasures, I know that Aggie would agree with me that there's nothing like a juicy murder. In 1939, B.T. Campbell, the managing editor of the Herald Express, wrote this about Aggie, and I'll quote as soon as I turn the page. Favorite occupation is following a good murder. Favorite story, a good murder. Favorite photograph, a good murder. Favorite fate for all editors, good murder. This afternoon I'll be focusing on not only on Aggie's personal life, but also on a few of the cases that actually helped to define her career as a reporter and uh, from her first major story until her last one. Agnes Mae Wilson, there she is, she's, she's cute or what? Agnes Mae Wilson was, uh, was born in San Francisco in December 1902, and her father Clifford was a journeyman glass blower, and as such, he traveled quite a bit. The family moved around a lot. Uh, when Aggie's mother, Mamie, died in childbirth in 1907, her father found it impossible to care for the girls on his own. He had, she had a sister, Leona, and it was Aggie and her younger sister, Leona. And with him being gone, with Clifford being gone so much, it was really difficult for him to care for the girls. So he would often hand them over to relatives in Terre Haute, Indiana. Aggie recalled that when she and Leona were together when they were being moved around. They didn't stay in Terre Haute for very long. They'd wind up sometimes uh, in the hands of public charity. Even the relatives couldn't, you know, couldn't take them sometimes. Clifford became distressed by the way that the daughters were being treated, and uh, he found two foster homes in Portland, Indiana, for the girls, each one willing to take one of the one of the daughters. But it was particularly agonizing for Aggie because she felt that she, being split up like that, she wasn't able to honor her mother's dying wish, which was that she should take care of her younger sister. And in fact, Aggie and Leona were not reunited until they were adults. Aggie's sister was sent to live with a farm family, and Aggie's uh, new home was with the, the Yuri family and their three sons. She was the favorite of the eldest son, Ralph. They hit it off. And uh, she said that he was the only person there who made her time bearable. She said it was a very serious environment. And she was glad for Ralph's company. She lost him though when he went, he was uh, conscripted or he joined the service for the First World War and went away. And in Aggie's letters to him, he sensed that she really wanted um, something different. She wasn't happy in the home with him gone. She wasn't happy with his family. She wanted to move. And somehow, and I don't know how, this is decades pre-internet, somehow he found one of Aggie's distant relatives in San Francisco. And she was sent to live with her. Um, I want to say a little bit something though before I get to the, to the relative. She actually, Aggie was a good student. And she skipped three grades, but by the time she was 16 years old, she sort of lost interest in her studies and she, she left school. Aggie took a job as a clerk in, a, in the basement of a, a Cartwright's department store in Portland, Indiana. And as I said, she became increasingly unhappy with the Yuri family. She just wasn't, wasn't happy there at all. Ralph was able to locate one of her relatives in San Francisco, and Aggie arrived in San Francisco in November of 1918. She moved in with a relative who lived in an apartment on Gary Street. Aggie knew she'd be expected to pitch in, get a job, and help with the household expenses, and she set out to look for work. After a few frustrating days of unsuccessful job hunting, she arrived at the apartment to find out that her relative had moved out and left Aggie there alone, broke, and homeless. Another of Aggie's female relatives stepped in and invited her to move to Hollywood and live with her. Now, Aggie was a teenager. She's very petite, though, 
And uh, so her brothers have got the notion that she could transform Aggie into a child star. But Aggie was not exactly our gang material. And uh, besides, she was already well into puberty. So that didn't stop the relative though, not one little bit. Undeterred, the woman kept putting bows in Aggie's hair and dragging her from studio to studio until finally she realized that plan wasn't going to work. So she too abandoned Aggie. Once more, Aggie was on the street. Aggie became a resident at the Salvation Army home located downtown LA. It's where um, the Biltmore Hotel is now. She moved in, yeah, she moved in there, and uh, she got a job at the Broadway department store, started working. She met a woman named Evelyn Connors. Evelyn was just a few months younger than Aggie, and they would become lifelong friends. In fact, Aggie would name her daughter after her friend Evelyn. And following a brief move to Salt Lake City, Utah, Aggie returned to LA. And when she got back, she found work as a waitress at the Pig and Whistle. Uh, that was uh, probably the Pig and Whistle just half a block down from here. Yeah, don't yeah. Really interrupt you. Yeah, no, no, you're absolutely half right. Half block's out there. Yeah, it was just down the street. And one day in April 1920, she was lamenting to Harry Underwood, a co-worker, that her Hollywood relative had resurfaced and was demanding money. She said, look, you have to move back in with me and you have to turn over your paycheck to me or I'm going to drop a dime on you to the juvenile authorities and you're going to go away. And Aggie was just beside herself. She was really, really frightened. But uh, Harry said, you know what? She can't do that. She can't do that at all. Not if we're married. And so the, the two married three weeks later on April 28, 1920. By 1926, Aggie and Harry had become the parents to a daughter Evelyn, named after her friend, and George, uh, both of whom are still alive. I've talked to them, they're in their 90s, they're delightful. Um, and he was reunited with Riona, excuse me, who came to live with the young family, and uh, Harry and Leona worked outside the home. And he stayed at home and took care of, of things there. But the family, even with two working people, still struggled to make ends meet. One of the small economies that Aggie practiced was to wear Leona's hand-me-down silk stockings. One day, Aggie asked Harry, you know, can I have a little money? I really want my own pair of stockings. It's nice that Leona's willing to pass hers along, but come on, I want my own pair. And uh, it was not to be. Harry explained the economics of silk stockings to Aggie and told her that it just wasn't going to work out. Well, she was a stubborn thing, and she said, well, okay, fine. If you're not going to fork over the money for the stockings, I'll get a job and I'll earn them myself. Well, in her own biography, she said she really didn't want to work outside the home, and she had no idea where to look for work. As it turned out, she was lucky a job found her, and it was, again, her friend Evelyn who saved the day. Uh, she caught a call from Evelyn, and Evelyn said, hey, we need a temporary switchboard operator down at the Daily Record. Would you be interested? Aggie jumped at the chance. It changed her life. Her position at the switchboard was supposed to be temporary, but they realized, her employers realized, that Aggie was an unusual person and that she was a person with potential. So they started finding other things for her to do. Uh, Gertrude Price, whose pseudonym, pseudonym was uh, Cynthia Gray, she was the women's editor at the paper, she became Aggie's mentor. And Aggie helped her with the annual Cynthia Gray Christmas Baskets for the Poor. And Gertrude encouraged Aggie to learn more about the newspaper business. You can see them in there somewhere, surrounded by the Christmas baskets. And Aggie continued to do that, even, even years later. She always, any time that, that Gertrude wanted anything, she always referred to her as Miss Price. And she was willing to help her no matter what. Aggie came to enjoy the hustle and bustle of the newsroom, and she loved being in the midst of a breaking story. In December 1927, the city was stunned and horrified when William Edward Hickman, who called himself the Fox, kidnapped and then brutally butchered a young schoolgirl, Marion Parker. That 
was married with her twin. She was one of twin girls. Hickman fled after the murder, and he was, uh, was one of the largest manhunts on the West Coast. They were looking for him everywhere. The, mu the murder was particularly brutal and gruesome. Aggie would later recall how she felt when they got word that Hickman had been located in Oregon. He's a little worse for wear there. I think he tripped and fell down some stairs. <laughs> 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 Yeah, he did, yeah. Sometimes you fall on your kids. <clears throat> it happened. You hit somebody with a phone book, and you don't see the thing. Um, but Aggie said about this moment, she said, as the bullets pumped in and the city side worked furiously at localizing, I couldn't keep myself in my niche. I committed the unpardonable sin of looking over shoulders of reporters as they wrote. I got underfoot. And what I thought was exasperation, Rod Brink, the city editor, said, all right, if you're so interested, take this dictation. I typed the dictation, part of the main running story. I was sunk. I wanted to be a reporter. Peggy's first big break came in May 1931. L.A. was shaken by the shooting deaths of two players in the city's shadowy government, sort of an invisible government. Charles H. Crawford, and uh, who's known as the Gray Fox, and Herbert F. Spencer. 52-year-old Crawford was a former saloon keeper who was uh, the city's vice king, really. That's what he did. And he didn't hold public office, but it said that he was the city's political boss and that he pulled the, the strings on the puppets in city government. Spencer, 45, was a former police reporter who had become associated with a political crusading weekly called the Critic of Critics, which coincidentally Charles Crawford actually financed. Now big shots in the, in the town in, in LA were worried about what, what could be revealed. They had pretty much everyone in city government at that time had skeletons in their closet. More than 24 hours after the shootings, tall, handsome, David Clark surrendered at the DA's office. Clark knew the office well. He had been a deputy DA himself, and at that time, he was running for a municipal judgeship. Joan, you know, um, Crawford's widow, in honor of his death, in honor of the location of the shooting, yes. would go on to build Crawford she into the world. She built Crossroads of the world in Hollywood. Yeah. That is the location yeah. of the shooting. Crawford, Crawford's office was there. It was exactly she right. With it, so then she built Crossroads of the world. Absolutely. Think about that the next time you go. <laughs> yeah, think about grizzly death. That's something that haunts me everywhere. Very was murdered in Echo Park. Um, oh. Aggie noticed a couple of gaps in the coverage. And it was the, the cover was the coverage was just absolutely frenzied as you can imagine. I mean, this was shaking up the city. And one of them, one of her one of her notions was her ticket into the story. Now she realized that nobody had interviewed Clark's parents. Working on the assumption that they lived nearby, that they lived in town, she began to search for them and she called every single clerk in the phone. <laughs> Finally, this is, now this is, dead, this is old school reporting. She didn't just Google them, you know? She, she got out those phone books and she's looking up every, and phoning them. She finally found them in Highland Park. And she, she spoke to her mentor, Gertrude Price, about her idea. She wanted to interview the clerks, get their take on the whole story. And Price encouraged Aggie to go ahead to follow up. Aggie scored an exclusive interview, and her story appeared on the front page above the fold um, with the headline, Mrs. Clark Says Son Innocent. It was her first double column byline. She got another big break when a friend set her up for an interview with Herbert Spencer's widow. Aggie knew that Mrs. Spencer was uh, familiar with newspapers and the newspaper business because Herb had been an editor. And Aggie played it smart. She didn't pretend to be anything she wasn't. She said, look, kind of a novice at this reporting thing. Um, I'm inexperienced, but, you know, I'll be fair. And, and uh, it worked. Mrs. Spencer liked Aggie. She gave her an exclusive interview. And Aggie's career was off and running. Now, Aggie had a few rough years in the uh, early 1930s during the Depression. The record cut her salary in half. 
They figured that as a married woman, she could absorb the loss. But of course, that wasn't true at all. Um, she tried a few things to bring in some extra money, but finally she and Harry were approached by a friend of theirs named Evelyn White to get into a publishing venture. It was a weekly called the East Side Guardian. It was the little newspaper that could. I'm Zaggy in the newsroom. Uh, and it did well enough to capture the attention of some of the community leaders in town on the east side. And they invited Aggie, Harry, and, uh, and Evelyn White to a, a meeting. And Aggie said, we thought it was legit, we thought it was bona fide because none of the people who were doing the inviting were gangsters. They were all city and community leaders. So they turn up at the meeting and they were really surprised when they found out that it was just a conference that aimed to divide the east side into 10 districts for vice and gambling. They wanted no part of that. Um, they, wanted no, they had no desire to participate in the so-called combination, which was sort of an alliance between city government and underworld thugs. They basically ran city government in LA for a long time. And they said no. They said no to the combination. And they were worried after that, saying, saying no was not something you really did. And they did it anyway, but they were worried about their health and their futures. So they visited a well-known attorney, S.S. Hahn, and they um, made affidavits as a precaution against retaliation. The only retaliation was monetary. The East Side Guardian failed, but at least they felt like they'd done the right thing. Aggie finally returned to the record full time, and she just she waited for another break, which finally came on an evening in May 1934. Now during the 1930s, kidnapping was a cottage industry, and uh, snatching wealthy citizens was a way for everyone, from gangsters to one-off crackpots, to make a little extra cash. Um, the kidnapping of the Lindbergh baby really upped the ante on these things, and it resulted in the uh, in much harsher penalties for kidnapping than had previously been the case. In fact, California enacted the death penalty for kidnapping. 47-year-old William Gettle, there he is, whose net worth was estimated to be about $3.5 million. This is in 1934. It would be a whole lot more zeros now. Um, was the perfect victim for a gang of small-time crooks. Gettle and his family lived on 723 Linden Drive in Beverly Hills. But he was, uh, but the oil man, the retired oil man, he wanted to retire at 40. He had to wait, he retired at 42. He was a retired oil man, and he was kidnapped from the grounds of his Arcadia ranch house during the evening of May 9th, 1934. The kidnapping was front page news, it was a huge story. And the kidnappers demanded a $60,000 ransom for his return, which his wife agreed to pay. Now, Aggie had been working the ghetto kidnapping since his disappearance, but it was several days before the story actually broke wide open. On May 14, 1934, Aggie and Victor Noble, who was the radio editor at the paper, um, he wrote the column, for the radio column. They were the only two people in the newsroom when they got the word that Gettle had been found alive. The way the case was solved made a great story, because what had happened was, before the ransom could be paid, LAPD had been looking into some, oh, bandits. Some, what, what were they doing? They, they were involved in a bank robbery. And they installed a dictaphone so that they could record conversations surreptitiously. And on it, they heard information relating to the kidnapping of Gettle. So even though it was an L.A. Sheriff's case, LAPD and the Sheriff's Office worked together to bring Gettle safely home. Uh, Gettle, when he, was, when he was brought home, reported that, you know, my kidnappers were actually not that bad to me. My only real complaint is that they kept my eyes taped shut the entire time. So he was handed a pair of tinted glasses so he could actually go out and withstand the daylight. The kidnapping was such a big story 
that uh, a local entrepreneur, and I love this, I love LA, was giving tours. Oh, yeah. yeah. And you can see the 10 cent thing, he probably, uh, it was probably originally a nickel, and he bumped it up, you know, because people, everyone wanted to see where Gavel had been held. So, I love that. I, 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 I love new business. <laughs> Aggie's coverage of the kidnapping helped put her back on the front page. Now, early in January 1935, she received an offer to work for uh, William Randolph Hearst's paper, the Herald Express. She'd been offered to work there before, but she'd always turned it down. The reason was is that she got a lot, she felt she would gain more experience working in a much smaller record. She was sort of a jack or jill of all trades. There, she was a little worried that she would get kind of sucked in at, at first paper and not be able to do quite as much. But uh, when she came to work one day, she got the news that the Daily Record had been sold to the uh, Illustrated Daily News. Now she had some uh, semi-quasi-official assurances that her job would be secure, but she, she thought, no, I think I'm ready, I'm ready for the big time, I'm gonna go work for Hearst. And that's what she did. The most important years of her career were just now going to begin. This is January 1935. Almost immediately after she started working at the Herald, Aggie was unofficially partnered with a photographer, or photog, as they were called. His name was Perry Fowler. She and Perry would work hundreds of cases together, and they became as close as brother and sister. On the job, the two of them never sat still waiting for a story to fall into their laps. They were very proactive. They got out and they looked for news. They ran it down. They routinely did what they called a milk run. It was sort of an early morning visit to the local holding tanks and all the local jails to see who got caught overnight for what. And uh, sometimes they just, you know, they just see what they could shake loose. It didn't always result in a, in, a, in a big story, but it was worth the effort. Sometimes all they found was a repentant dame. So, Joe, let me just so people can visualize this. The Goodwill on Avenue 20, that's where the old Lincoln Heights Jail was, and there used to be a court attached to it. Yeah. So, the LAPD could just book people and process them all right there. So, if you want to spend your Saturday morning <laughs> at the Goodwill and get some breakfast, you're, sort of, you're in Aggie's footsteps. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And, and visit the jail before, um, see what's happening is like uh, the, 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 the rail, the, the the yeah, the 300 line. mile an hour rail yeah. trains are coming, yeah. and the Hoover crack parking lot for your Hoover car has, is going to take out the jail. Yeah, I feel just like the Jetsons. Yeah. So mm -hmm. go visit the jail for the Hoover crack parking lot in places. Next Before it goes bye bye forever. Yeah, keeping your eyes open worked really well for Aggie, being proactive in the news like that. And that's the way they did it then. You had to. You had to be out on the street looking for a story. You couldn't just sit and wait for somebody to phone something in. Now, when she learned that murderess Clara Phillips, known as Tiger Girl, was going to be released from the women's prison in Tehachapi, uh, she sold her editor, Cappy Merrick, on the idea of going up to Tehachapi to write a series, writing some features on the institution. Tehachapi had only recently opened, it opened in the early 1930s. It was the first women's prison in the state of California. Before that, women had been housed at San Quentin. They had their own wing. But, uh, yeah, they were housed at San Quentin. So this, now in the 30s, they had Tehachapi. So when Aggie got wind of this, she, uh, she said she really needed to get up there. So she and her husband, Harry, and Perry and his wife, drove 140 miles out to, um, to Tehachapi. Aggie knew that Phillips was going to be a good story because she'd been convicted in 1922 of the hammer, that's the hammer. Yeah, she, she actually used it till it broke on uh, the woman she thought was uh, the arrival for her husband's affections. Yeah, she used that on her head. And then she rolled a 50 pound boulder onto her chest just to make sure she was dead. Um, Aggie and her husband, okay, okay and, she, and Perry Fowler and his wife drove up to, to Atchapi, but when they got there, they, they found out that the, 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 you know, they went to talk to the people in charge and we're told that, uh, no, she's not, she's not being released. They were really concerned that they'd wasted the trip. Uh, they'd spent, you know, a few hours on the road just getting out there. But um, they bumped into Warden Houlihan 
from San Quentin who just happened to be visiting at Tehachapi. And he told them they couldn't interview Phillips, but he said, I can't let you talk to her. There's nothing that says I can't speak with her. And that's the women's prison, prison at Tehachapi. They have what they call cottages, and uh, they let the women sew their own clothes. I think the idea then was more focused on rehabilitation instead of punishment. And at the time, women made very good candidates for that. I don't know about now, but then they, then they really did. Now they can't sew. That'd be what <laughs> You mean I can't shop? I need to go online. But there, they, you know, they started making their own clothes. And the idea, like I said, was to rehabilitate them. Joan, is that building still there? Uh, the buildings, there's some buildings still there. Oh, the earthquake. It, the earthquake yeah. in 53, I think, took it out. There's, a, I think there's a supermax or a max there now on the, on the grounds, but I think some of the buildings may still be extant, but for the Sorry. most part, yeah, if you drove up there, you wouldn't see this, unfortunately. Um, there's a very good German deli. There you go. <laughs> go, for the, go for the German deli, stay for the um, max prisoners who escape. And we're looking for a car to get away in. That'll be fun. Okay. So, um, Aggie, so, so Hulan sent for Clara, you know, and, and so he, he interviewed her while Aggie sort of sat quietly, um, memorized quotes and facts. And she wrote a, Aggie wrote a great three part series on Tehachapi called City of Forgotten Women. It was, picked, it was about life. In, in prison for these women, and it was picked up for publication by other newspapers around the country. She remained in touch with the prison authorities who would oftentimes give her a heads up when someone really notorious was about to be released so she could do a story, and that's exactly what they did when Clara's release date came up, and that's Aggie and Clara. Undoubtedly a photo taken by Harry Fowler. Actually, I know it is. It's from his collection. Um, my favorite Aggie story, really, and the one that shows how far she would go to scoop her competition, occurred in 1935. The Herald had learned in advance that, uh, of the filing of the will of Albert Cheney. Cheney was a wealthy, retired manufacturer who had died suddenly on the eve of his wedding to a woman named Hazel Lab, one of my favorite female felons in LA history. She's, yeah, she's adorable. She's sad that she doesn't stay that way, but then none of us do. Seven years earlier, at, Hazel had been suspected of the shooting death of her husband, retired druggist John I. Blab. House is still there. It's in the valley. I love that. And this is a reconstruction. That's actually a detective playing the dead guy on the ground. Now, the cops really hadn't been able to pin the murder on Hazel, but they did keep track of her. They wanted to know what she because they felt for sure she'd done it, but they just couldn't pin it on her. Aggie was hot on the Cheney story, and the second she and, and she scored an interview with Hazel, an exclusive. She she wanted to keep her then from talking to other newspapers, and uh, she realized that she in order to keep her exclusive, she was going to have to keep an eye on Hazel. She said, Aggie said. I decided that perhaps an obvious hiding place might be the last where the opposition reporters would look. My house. <laughs> Aggie and Hazel arrived at Aggie's home just in time for a potluck dinner with 40 little girls from Aggie's daughter's Girl Scout troop. <laughs> so, according to Aggie, Hazel pitched in and helped to serve dinner. <laughs> and when it was over, she put on an apron and helped to wash and dry the dishes. Uh, I asked Aggie's daughter if any of the other girls' parents ever knew about Hazel, and she said that her mom thought that it was better left alone. <laughs> so no, they didn't tell the other parents that they'd hosted this nice lady who just happened to have killed her husband, and perhaps committed another murder as well earlier in her life. Now, a couple of months later, Hazel was convicted. I know, she's... <laughs> I love the setup. Hazel was convicted of forgery for the will. She'd written Cheney's will in purple ink, 
on some hotel stationery. Needless to say, the authorities were a little suspicious, and so she was convicted for forgery and sentenced to from one and a half to 19 years in prison. She was also convicted of the 1928 slaying of her husband, then John Glapp, and uh, she was sentenced to that from, to from five years to life. Aggie accompanied Hazel and other women in a sheriff's car out to Tehachapi. Now, let me just tell you who these people are here. Of course, on the very left is our favorite, Hazel. Um, then we have Deputy we Sheriff. Detective Hazel? Yes, she does. Oh my God. <laughs> I know, the bag is kick ass, right? Um, <laughs> Deputy Sheriff Vern Fleming. And uh, Deputy, there's a female deputy, Ada Overin. And then Frances Mabel Willies is the first woman there. She was convicted of slaying her elderly dentist sweetheart. And Mrs. Bertie Brockman, convicted of trying to poison her son-in-law, is the last one there. Um, yes, in fact, Hazel is holding a copy of Master Detective magazine. Yes, indeed. She wanted something to read on the way that it had to be in Book and Glamour. Who, who's going to sit and talk to a bunch of other felons? You're going to be seeing them a lot over the next lifetime. So, uh, following their arrival at Tehachapi, Aggie phoned the Herald with a quote from Hazel. Hazel said, don't say I cried or carried on, because I'll be back. And she would be. As you can see from this photo, for some reason, Aggie developed a soft spot for Hazel. And uh, Hazel even called Aggie when she was later released from prison. I don't know what that was about. They just, she just, she liked her. She just hit it up. I think Aggie's a very empathetic person, and I think she could always see that, you know, having if you take another road, you can end up. So she was always pretty empathetic. Who else was she gonna call? And there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Aggie was happy to have her over. She was. It made a great story all these years later, right? Now, at the end of her first year with the Herald, Aggie along with the rest of L.A., was um, stunned by the news of the death of popular actress and cafe owner, Thelma Todd. Known as the Ice Cream Blonde, Todd was a gifted comedian, and she had worked with some of the best in the business, including the Marx Brothers. She was found dead mid-December 1935. She was slumped over in the seat of her chocolate-colored uh, Lincoln Fate. Speculation began immediately. Was Thelma, was it an accident? Was it suicide? Or had she been murdered by gangster Lucky Luciano, who was rumored to be interested in using her cafe as a front for gambling? That's Thelma Todd's cafe right there. The building's still there, right, Richard? Yeah. Can, we, can we take a second and, and clarify where the building was? Yes, please. Okay, so, so this, is, this is now Hollis Productions. This is where the bridge is over PCH. This is the cafe. This is Todd's apartment. But her body was found here in the house on the next road up in the garage. Todd parked in a garage in a house in the street above where the back, where, in, in, in above. So if you go to the land bridge and you cross the land bridge and you're standing right here, that's not where she died. You have to walk up some stairs behind Paul's Productions and get to this. This garage. Yeah, that's she, where she died. Yeah, she parked in the garage. It was uh, Roland West. He was her lover at the time, and he lived above her on the hill. Deathbed confession, question. Yeah, well, supposedly. He supposedly confessed that it was an accident that he closed the garage door. She, had, she died of carbon monoxide poisoning. And he supposedly conf confessed to actor Chester Morris. But, I mean, you know, there's no corroboration past that. A story I find credible, but you never know. Aggie had a particularly close connection with this case, though, because it was the first autopsy that she ever uh, witnessed. In fact, she was one of the few people who remained standing at the end of it. Uh, now, even though Thelma Todd's death was ruled to be an accidental one, there were a lot of things about it that troubled people, and Aggie felt that way too. She was perplexed by some of the mysteries and the inconsistencies in, in, the, in the case. Now Aggie wrote, in crucial phases of the case, official versions as told reporters varied from subsequent statements. It was known where and what Miss Todd had eaten. She'd been at the Trocadero. 
on Saturday night. Stomach contents found in the autopsy did not appear to bear out reports on, on the meal. There were other discrepancies, including interpretations of the condition of the body and its position in the automobile. Aggie talked about a detective, she said, who was working on trying to resolve some of these questions, some of these inconsistencies. And she wrote, he was deeper in the mystery, receiving threatening calls, which carried a secret and unlisted number. And he was warned to lay off if you know what's good for you. And then Aggie also wrote about the same detective. In his investigation, the detective stopped and searched an automobile of a powerful motion picture figure. In the car, surprisingly, was a witness who had reported that Todd had been seen on Sunday. This would have been the day after she was dead. Okay. Near the witness was a packed suitcase. The investigator told me, told Aggie, the owner of the car attempted to have him ousted from the police department. Aggie would not reveal the name of the detective. She also said that there's a disquieting feeling in working some of these cinema land death cases, whether natural or mysterious. One senses intangible pressures, as in the Thelma Todd story. After the inquest testimony, in which one sensational theory was that the blonde star who died of carbon monoxide gas was the victim of a killer, the case eventually was dropped as one of accidental, though mysterious, death. Over the course of her career, Aggie would attend other autopsies, of course, and she would also find herself frequently enough at the scene of many grisly murders. I spoke to her daughter, Evelyn, who told me that one night Aggie came home from a particularly brutal murder scene. Uh, she said her mom stripped off all of her clothes and threw them in the fireplace, and she said, I'll never get the smell of death out of them. Now, as Aggie gained more experience as a crime reporter, she also gained a reputation for solving crimes. She said, stories have been printed that I've solved crimes. Let me say that I'm not a reporter who thinks she's smarter than the cops. Well, she may not have been smarter, but uh, her skills in a, as an observer were as good as those of any police detective. And on uh, March 16th, 1936, Aggie was going to get a chance to put her crime-solving skills to the test. She interviewed, <clears throat> excuse me, Samuel Whitaker, a tall, gray-haired, retired church organist who was distraught over the shooting death of his wife, Ethel, the night before. The 44-year-old woman had been killed during a holdup in their uh, motel room on Alvarado Street, just opposite Westlake Park. Whitaker was being hailed as a hero because he managed to fire off at least a round that hit the person thought to be the killer, uh, James Fagan Culver. Culver was not seriously wounded, and Aggie managed to set up a photo opportunity uh, between Culver, Whitaker, and in the photo, it, in the foreground, on the left, that's Whitaker, on the lower right, that's Culver, behind are two police detectives. Thad Brown is behind Whitaker, and Ray Geese is sort of behind Culver there keeping an eye on everything. Um, she managed to, uh, she positioned them, of course, for maximum drama in the photo. And as Whitaker lifted his cane to point at the man who slain his wife, um, Aggie saw the elderly organist wink at the guy that was supposed to be the killer. And she just, just like, wait a minute, wait, this is something, this is not right, something's wrong here. She waited for a few moments. She thought, well, maybe I didn't see what I'm sure I saw. Um, thought maybe he had a nervous tick or something. So she motioned to, uh, to Thad Brown. And she, she told him um, what she'd seen. And uh, she said, Thad, ask why Whitaker winked at him. Don't let the kid wriggle out of it. Whitaker did wink at him. There's no mistake about it. Now, that assured Aggie that she had an overactive imagination, but he went with her suggestion anyway, and he cracked the murder plot. Culver fessed up. He said that Whitaker had provided him with a 38 revolver and told him that the plan 
was just to stage a holdup at the hotel room. Uh, just a harmless stick up. But when Comer arrived at the motel room, Whitaker was armed with a 32. He starts firing. Um, Culver's freaking out. This isn't how it was supposed to go. This wasn't the plan that he knew it at all. Ethel dropped to the floor dead, and Culver started to return fire, and then he, he was wounded, terrified. He ran, he, he ended up on the roof of a nearby home, and the cops captured him. Now, obviously, Whitaker had planned to silence his unwitting accomplice, but his plan snagged. Of course, when Culver was only wounded. Aggie covered Whitaker's trial, and he was after he was charged with murder, he was found guilty and given a life sentence for killing his wife, even though it had been one of Culver's rounds that had ended it. He was also given a uh, one to ten year term for shooting Culver. Aggie was in the courtroom when uh, Whitaker told the judge, he's waving his fist, I hope God may strike me dead before I get to my cell if I am guilty of this horrendous crime. While he was being booked into San Quentin, Whitaker dropped dead in a heart attack. Joe, they think we're running out of time, so maybe this is a really good place to start taking some questions and maybe just wrap up. Okay, well, let me just go a little further. I want to get to the very last bit, and I can go through the slides to get to it. There are other cases that Aggie allegedly solved. And, but her last case as a reporter was the 1947, and let's just get there. Oh, well, can the, we go back one slide? Yeah, that's the Black that's, Dahlia. That's the bar around the corner from the record. Yep, the Black Dahlia case. Now, as a reporter, she was on the scene when that case was uh, first found out, when the body was first found. And there have been several people over the years who have said that they tag the case, the Black Dahlia, Aggie's one of them. Um, it's hard to say after all these years if she did or not, but she was not known as a liar. She uh, was pulled from the case, she never knew why. She was in the midst of reporting on it, and she was yanked off of it and just benched. This is the first serious suspect, Red Manley. And there's Beth Short in Hollywood just a few months before she would die in January 47. And there's Short. So Aggie wanted to follow this case to its conclusion, but she couldn't. She was promoted to city editor, effective immediately. She, never, she said she never understood the timing of her promotion. And uh, some conspiracy theorists surmise that the timing of her promotion leads one to believe that she was close to a solution, discovering the identity of the Dahlia's killer. Well, what if she wasn't just close? Uh, many years after the Dahlia case had gone ice cold, Aggie told her grandsons, I asked them, who had murdered Elizabeth Short. But when asked for the name of the killer, all Aggie would say was, he's dead and it doesn't matter anymore. So Aggie had a remarkable career in journalism that spanned four decades. She was even the subject of a TV show, This Is Your Life. As a, as a reporter, she covered the most deranged crimes in Los Angeles, and as an editor for the Herald, she earned the respect of her peers and the affection of the people she worked with. In his autobiography, Reporters, journalist Will Fowler said this of Aggie, the last thing I remember Aggie saying to her friends who came to celebrate her retirement party, this is in the late 60s, was, please don't forget me. And who the hell ever could? Sure. They would. They would be at a crime scene. <coughs> Excuse me. Sometimes 
had been a crime scene before the cops arrived. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, had he uh, covered the, uh, uh, was it the, uh, the trial of, of Frank Shaw, the mayor of L.A., which he knew oh, yeah. was Oh yeah, and he definitely did. Uh, Frank Shaw, one of our illustrious mayors of Los Angeles, was the first mayor in the country to be recalled. Uh, he was recalled for corruption. And this was in 1939, I think. And Aggie did cover the case. Yeah, she was all over she was all over everything. And by this point she'd been working for Hearst for about four years. So she was well entrenched. And she had the thing that was really good for her about working for Hearst was that they had deep pockets at the Herald Express, and so she was able to maneuver and get around town in a way that she hadn't been able to do it at, at the Rizzo. Any more? Yeah, Rory. Where was the uh, kidnapper's house, the Ten Cent? Uh... Ah, La Crescenta. La Crescenta. I might be able to find an address if you're interested, but still there. <laughs> Road trip. What does it cost to tour now? <laughs> um, prices have gone up. It's not 10 cents anymore. It's going to cost at least a quarter. <laughs> Inflation. That's all I can say. Any more? No, thank you so much. Let's take, let's take 15 minutes. It's, it's old stuff, I'm telling Yeah, we're still going to take 15 minutes. Uh, we're going to start, Paul, you're going to start at 10 after, you're still going to have an hour, don't worry. We're going to get started at 10 after 2. We're going to take a break. I know a lot of people came in, so run down and get an espresso, order a sandwich. 10 after 1, what did I say? No. In 15 minutes. In 10 minutes after 1. Thank you for Thank you. Okay, let's go. And Paul, don't.